Mr. Chairman and gentlemen of the convention, I would be presumptuous indeed to present myself against the distinguished gentleman to whom you have listened if this were a mere measuring of abilities. But this is not a contest between persons. The humblest citizen in all the land, when clad in the arm of a righteous cause, is stronger than all the hosts of error. I come to speak to you in defense of a cause as holy as the cause of liberty, the cause of humanity. When this debate is concluded, a motion will be made to lay upon the table the resolution offered in commendation of the administration and also the resolution offered in condemnation of the administration. We object to bringing this question down to the level of person. The individual is but an atom. He is born, he acts, he dies. But principles are eternal. And this has been a contest over a principle. Never before in the history of this country has there been witnessed such a contest as that through which we have just passed. Never before in the history of American politics has a great issue been fought out as this issue has been by the voters of a great party. On the 4th of March, 1895, a few Democrats, most of them members of Congress, issued an address to the Democrats of the nation, asserting that the money question was the paramount issue of the hour, declaring that a majority of the Democratic Party had the right to control the action of the party on this paramount issue, and concluding with the request that the believers in the free coinage of silver in the Democratic Party organize, take charge of, and control the policy of the Democratic Party. Three months later at Memphis, an organization was perfected, and the silver Democrats went forth openly and courageously proclaiming their belief and declaring that if successful, they would crystallize into a platform the declaration which they had made. Then began the conflict, with a zeal approaching the zeal which inspired the crusaders who followed Peter the Hermit. Our silver democrats went forth from victory unto victory, until they are now assembled, not to discuss, not to debate, but to enter up the judgment already rendered by the plain people of this country. In this contest, brother has been arrayed against brother, father against son. The warmest ties of love, acquaintance, and association have been disregarded. All leaders have been cast aside when they refused to give expression to the sentiments of those whom they would lead, and new leaders have sprung up to give direction to this cause of truth. Thus has the contest been waged, and we have assembled here under as binding and solemn instructions as were ever imposed upon the representatives of the people. When you, turning to the gold delegate, come before us and tell us that we're about to disturb your business interests, we reply that you have disturbed our business interests by your court. We say to you that you have made the definition of a businessman too limited in its application. The man who is employed for wages is as much a businessman as his employer. The attorney in a country town is as much a businessman as the corporation council in a great metropolis. The merchant at the crossroads store is as much a businessman as the merchant of New York. The farmer who goes forth in the morning and toils all day, who begins in the spring and toils all summer, and who by the application of brain and muscles and the natural resources of the country creates wealth, is as much a businessman as the man who goes upon the board of trade and bets upon the price of grain. The miner who goes down a thousand feet into the earth or climbs two thousand feet upon the cliff and brings forth that from their hiding places of precious metals to be poured into channels of trade are as much businessmen as the few financial magnates who in a back room corner the money of the world. We come to speak for this broader class of businessmen. We say not one word against those who live upon the Atlantic coast, but the hardy pioneers who 
have braved all the dangers of the wilderness and made the desert to blossom as the road. The pioneers way out west who rear their children near to nature's heart where they can mingle their voices with the voices of the birds. Out there where they have erected schoolhouses for the education of their young. Churches where they praise their creator. And cemeteries where rest the ashes of their dead. These people, we say, are as deserving of the consideration of our party as any people in this country. It is for these that we speak. We do not come as aggressors. Our war is not a war of conquest. We are fighting in defense of our homes, our families, and posterity. We have petitions, and our petitions have been scorned. We have entreated, and our entreaties have been disregarded. We have begged, and they have mocked when our calamity came. We beg no longer. We entreat no more. We petition no more. We defy them. We go forth confident that we shall win. Why? Because upon the paramount issue of this campaign, there is not a spot of ground upon which the enemy will dare to challenge battle. If they tell us that the gold standard is a good thing, we shall point to their platform and tell them that their platform pledges the party to get rid of the gold standard and substitute by metalism. I call your attention to the fact that some of the very men who are in this convention today and who tell us that we ought to declare in favor of international bimetallism, thereby declaring the gold standard is wrong and that the principle of bimetallism is better, these very people four months ago were open and avowed advocates of the gold standard and were then telling us that we could not legislate two metals together even with the aid of all the world. If the gold standard is a good thing, we ought to declare in favor of its retention and not in favor of abandoning it. And if the gold standard is a bad thing, why should we wait until other nations are willing to help us to let go? If they tell us that the gold standard is the standard of civilization, we reply to them that this, the most enlightened of all the nations of the earth, has never declared for a gold standard and that both the great parties this year are declaring against it. More than that, they will search the pages of history in vain to find a single instance where the common people of any land have ever declared themselves in favor of the gold standard. They can find where the holders of fixed investments have declared for a gold standard, but not for the masses have. Mr. Carlyle said in 1878, that this was a struggle between the idle holders of idle capital and the struggling masses who produce the wealth and pay the taxes of the country. They tell us that the great cities are in favor of the gold standard. We reply that the great cities rest upon our broad and fertile prairies. Burn down your cities and leave our farms and your cities will spring up again as if by magic. But destroy our farms, and the grass will grow in the streets of every city of the country. We care not upon what line the battle is fought. If they say bimetallism is good, but that we cannot have it until other nations help us, we reply that instead of having a gold standard, because England has, we will restore bimetallism, and then let England have bimetallism, because the United States has. If they dare to come out in the open field and defend the gold standards a good thing, we will fight them to the uttermost. Having behind us the producing masses of this nation and the world, supported by the commercial interests, the laboring interests, and the toilers everywhere, we will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold.